right. It's great to have you here today in worshiping. It's great to have our uh, uh, live uh, audience, live streaming audience. And uh, I was just looking in the back, and they have it up on Facebook. So we're, there's lots of ways. You can go on YouTube uh, during the week, or you can go live streaming, or you can go uh, uh, find the, the services on, uh, on Facebook as well. That's kind of a cool thing. And uh, hey, I'm excited about today because we are starting. I'm not sure if anybody's told you, but we are starting the 50-day adventure of faith. Did you guys know that? Did you, did you see that? <laughs> so I want you to turn to somebody beside you, and I want you to go, it's starting today. Would you do that real quick? Turn to the person beside you. I love it. That's great. That is so much fun. Listen, I want us to grow over the next 50 days. I want us to grow in faith by engaging people where they're at, wherever you come to us spiritually. If, you've, if you're a brand new Christian, we're excited that you're here. If you're just trying to check things out, you haven't even said yes to Jesus, I'm glad you're here. If you've been to a, a, a follower of Jesus Christ most of your life, I'm glad you're here. Wherever you come to us spiritually, we want you to grow over the next 50 days in your faith. So we want to we want, we want to be engaging people where they're at. We want to be equipping people to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ. That's kind of the goal, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And then we want to empower people to make a difference. We believe that when Jesus Christ comes and does a miracle for us, he really does a miracle through us to bless other people. Amen? Amen? All right, good. I got five people with me today. All right, that's good. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, right at the first of your notes, verse 7 says this. Let your roots grow down into him, Jesus Christ, and draw up nourishment from him so that you will grow in your faith. You'll grow strong and courageous. God wants you to grow in your faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse eight. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is Abraham. And, and, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse eight says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed God's call to go. Abraham was retired. He was in a place called Ur. I, I love that. I think that's one of my favorite uh, little stats in the Bible, little uh, uh, details in the Bible. Because uh, if anybody said, Abraham, where are you from? Ur. <laughs> I think that's really funny, don't you? So he's from Ur, and God says, hey, listen, I want you to go. And, 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 and I love the rest of this verse says, God's called to him to go to another place that God promised him to give to him. And then I want you to say this last little bit with me. Uh, uh, he left his own country, watch this, say the last little bit in yellow, without knowing where he was. I don't think I do that. See, when I start off on a trip, I want to know where we're going. Anybody else with me? And I, I don't want to just drive somewhere and not know where I'm going. I want to, Abraham, he's up in here, he's, he's, he's in retirement, and, and God looks at him and says, dust off that retirement. I have the greatest journey of your life is right out in front of you. And God says to us right here today, right now, as we start these 50 days of faith, he says, listen, when you live by faith, it involves going places. You don't even know where you're going, but God does. God has a place that he wants to take you in the next 50 days. Anybody with me on this journey? Amen. I love it. I, I think that's awesome. So in the next 50 days, we're going to talk about bold faith. In the next 50 days, we're going we're gonna to look at where God wants us to go individually and where God wants us to go as a church family. So why are we doing this? It's because everything that God does in your life, watch this. This is really cool. He does through his grace and his mercy. How many of you, how many of you realize today that you don't... You don't deserve God's grace like he gives it to you. Anybody realize that today? See, God gives his grace and his mercy through us. Watch this. Through our faith. And, and, and I think that's awesome. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, impossible to please God. And then Matthew chapter 9, verse 29 says this. According to your faith, it will be done to you. We're going to have a memory verse every week, and that's our memory verse for today. So leave that up there just real quick. I want you to work on this. Listen, let me talk about it real quick, and then we'll come back to it. God says, if you want a little bit of blessing, you just have to have a little bit of faith. But if you have a lot of faith, you will have a lot of blessing. Anybody say amen to that? Okay, so according to your faith, it will be done to you. Now, I, I, I want you to look at that really good. And the only way I know to memorize scripture is to say it a couple times. So I want you to say this out loud with me. Let's, let's read this two times. According to your faith, it will be done to you. Let's say it one more time. According to your faith, it will be done to you. Now, take it off the screen. Here we go. Here's the test. Did everybody got it? Ooh, I'm nervous. 
Okay, let's say it together. According to your faith, it will be done to you. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. God says, I want you to develop faith. Now, there are three purposes in this series on bold faith in the next 50 days. So they're not in your notes. I only get to put just a small amount of stuff in your notes, but I got a bunch of stuff. We're going to be here for a couple hours today. Anybody all right with that? <laughs> no, it's not true. Okay, so here's three things, three purposes of why we're going through these 50 days. Number one is to advance our spiritual maturity. You're going to grow in the next 50 days spiritually, my goal is that you'll grow in the next 50 days more than you'll grow for the entire year, the rest of the year. I hope this next 50 days is this huge growth spurt in, 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 in your spiritual life. I wanna challenge you, maybe like you've never been challenged before in these 50 days. James 1, chapter three says, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Verse four of that same passage says, let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character. And then read this last line with me and ready for anything. Listen, I want you to be ready for anything. I want you to be able to, when, when the storms come in your life over the next couple of years, I want you to be able to stand strong because you have a, a strong faith in your life. I want you to be ready for anything that comes to your life in the next few years. So we're going to advance in our spiritual maturity. Second thing, the second purpose is I, I want us to enhance our relational unity. I want us to enhance our spiritual uh, our, uh, relational unity. When, when people work together for a common goal, when people give for a common cause, when we pray for a common reason, it draws us closer together. And I gotta tell you, as, as, as a leader of this church, I want our church to be close-knit together. Now, you know what's hard? It's hard to be close to 1,600 people, amen? But you can be really close in a small group. And so I hope, my goal is, is that you'll find a small group that you'll get really tied into and you'll have that relational unity. And as we come here on Sunday mornings, that we will be packed. Did you notice it's kind of full today? Nobody? Last Sunday, we had 1,600 people here, and I'm telling you, it's going to get a little bit squish, and in that way, there's going to be a relational unity you'll have with the people around you, but that's good. Look at them. They're good people, but even beyond that, I want us to have, this is our goal, Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Listen to the, unit, the relational unity they had in, uh, in, in the early church. The believers in Jerusalem church were united in their hearts and spirit. Why? Because they shared everything with each other. In fact, people would sell what they owned even their homes and give the money as an offering. So I want this 50 days to be a time that we, we get together and we find this relational unity with the people around us. And then here's the third purpose. I want to honor the everyday heroes of the faith. I want to honor people who are serving in our church family. And, 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 and over the next seven weeks, we're going to honor seven different people. And we're going to honor those who have been faithful for months and years and decades in our church. We want you to know how much we appreciate you. And we just want to take a moment just to honor people who are the heroes of faith in our church. Paul gives us an example of this in, in Philippians chapter two. He talks about Epaphroditus. Now, I, I, I thought long and hard, and I tried to come up with a nickname for Epaphroditus, but I can't come up with a nickname. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the person beside you, only if you know them. In fact, probably just if you came with them and look at them and say, I like that name, Epaphroditus. Just say that only if you know the person, only if you know the person, let's do that, Epaphroditus. <laughs> get Kleenexes out. You know there's Kleenexes in the chair in front of you. That's great. That's awesome. So Philippians chapter 2, Epaphroditus, here's what Paul says. Epaphroditus works and serves. Paul says he works and serves with me in the army of Christ. When I needed help, you sent Epaphroditus to me. And then Paul says, welcome him back in the Lord with much joy. And, and here's what I want to get to. Here's the point. Give honor to people like him for Epaphroditus risked his life to give me the help that I needed. Listen, there's so many times in the Bible that it commands us, we need to honor people who have sacrificed for the benefit of other people. Not sacrifice to make them great, but sacrifice for the sake of other people. And today and every day for these 50 days, uh, not every day for 50 days, every day, every Sunday for these 50 days, I, I want us to honor people who have uh, been heroes of the faith here in this church. I, I wanna honor somebody today who every time we say there's a mission trip, this person raises their hand and is the first one in line to say, I want to go. This is the person that just constantly, constantly goes on mission trips. About 15 years ago, we needed somebody to be a Sunday school teacher. Uh, the person who was a teacher moved away, and, and we just said, hey, Dave, oh, I gave it away. Shoot, man, I messed up. 
I said to this person, would you teach uh, this Sunday school class? He goes, Craig, I've never, I've never taught before, but if you need me to teach, I'll teach. And he became the Sunday school teacher. He's uh, been involved in our student ministry. He's been involved in our young adult ministry. And today I want us to honor a hero of the faith at OVCN. His name is Dr. Dave Burroughs. And I want us to honor these people like we mean it from the bottom of our hearts. So I want you to stand with me and clap and honor one of our own, Dr. Dave Burroughs. Come on up, Dave. <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah, I know. We love you. I just want to make sure you know that. That's awesome. Thank awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, you can have a seat. Thank you so much, guys. You may not know Dr. Dave, so let me just tell you just a little bit more about him. I remember two years ago, I went to India with Dave. Dave goes to India every year and does a checkup, a dental checkup. He's an endodontist, which means you're a foot doctor, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he is a, uh, he's a uh, root canal doctor. And I, I, if you ever talk to Dave, ask him this. Ask him to describe for you the spiritual gift of, of doing root canals. And he really believes it's true, isn't it? That God has given you a gift of being able to, to uh, feel the root. And, and it's uh, one of those cool things that God has given you that gift. But he, every year, uh, besides going on all the other mission trips, every year he makes his way to India and uh, does dental checkup and does everything he can. Now, they don't have a dental uh, a workroom right there for him, so he has to pack up all of his stuff. And I, I remember going two years with you, Dave, uh, and, and as we're going with our group to India, you had all this stuff in, uh, that you packed up in kind of a mobile dental uh, uh, ch uh, not chair, but all the equipment. And as we were going, you looked at me and you said, Wow, I, I, I've been praying that God would help get this through and we could get it on the other side in India. And I looked at you and I said, what do you mean you hope? And you said, well, I, I never know if they're gonna let the dental equipment go through. And I always just pray like crazy and just believe that God's gonna do something. And, and so we got to the other side and we rejoiced when we got the equipment on the other side and uh, got it on the thing. Do you remember uh, the, uh, the guy that took us with all that equipment? He got stood up on the top of his van and the van kind of caved in on top and, and it it was kind of funny because he had so much equipment of yours and that was great. But uh, I, I just want to tell you that you have blessed my heart time after time after time as you've just been open to what God wants to do. You're always going on mission trips and we just want to give you this, this uh, uh, sculpture. It's from uh, the guy, Scott Stearman, the guy who is going to do our sculpture out front. He did this and it's of, uh, of Jesus serving, washing uh, uh, the disciples' feet. And uh, I, I want to give this to you, and I want to just say, Dave, thank you for serving in our church and being a hero of the faith uh, amongst our congregation. And we just want to recognize you today and say thank you for what you've done uh, in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you so much. I love you, brother. You mean a lot to me. I'm excited for the next one. Anybody else? It is going to be so cool. I, I, I asked Dave, I said, Dave, I'm, I'm going to do an illustration. I need you to come to all the services. And he knew about this service, second service, but first service, he just thought he was coming today to help me out. So isn't that cool that, that uh, he did that? Uh, <laughs> this is the right thing to do. Amen? Amen. We, we need to honor our heroes of the faith here in our church. Well, it, l let me get to this and then we'll get to your, some of you are going, when are you going to get to the notes? And I, I, I promise I'm going to get to them. <laughs> You say, Craig, how are we going to grow in our faith? There's four ways. One is on Sunday mornings. When you come on Sunday mornings, I want you to be ready for God to do a great work in your heart to build your faith, to grow your faith. Sunday mornings is going to be the key time that we come together and we kind of hear a great story uh, uh, in the Bible about God's uh, uh, growing somebody's faith and how that applies to our lives. And, and today's story is awesome. I, I love it. One of my favorite uh, miracles in the Bible. And then the second thing is our small groups are going to play a part in this. And I know that we have so many different small groups. We, we had a connection event last Sunday night, and we actually started four new small groups out of that connection event. That's exciting. I got to tell you, as a church, that's an awesome thing to have new people getting involved. And in, in, we had our membership class yesterday, and about 80% of the people in the membership class had already joined a small group. Amen? 
See, I think that's a really cool statistic. I think that's a, a, a sign of growth. Well, listen, in small groups, you may have already been doing a series, and we're not demanding this, but we're asking this. If you can put that series aside for a little bit, and, and just for these 50 days, for seven weeks, if you could kind of find some way that your small group can kind of connect with uh, these seven weeks, that would be a great thing. We'd appreciate it so much. Uh, I have a video, five to 10. It's a short video every week that we're gonna put out. It's out on YouTube. And uh, you go to Oro Valley, Nazar uh, Oro Valley Nazarene and uh, look up 50 Days of Faith and it'll pop up right there. Uh, just search for that. If you want a hard copy of the uh, uh, questions for small group, you can get them at the welcome table or they're on our website and you, your small group can follow along. The third part is our memory verse. Everybody remember our memory verse? <laughs> According to your faith, it will be done to you. So why don't we say it together? According to your faith, it will be done. That's awesome. You guys got it. I love it. You're one seventh the way through in all the memory verses. And then the fourth thing, and I love this. This is one of the coolest things is that our children and our, our youth are going to be following along with us. And so listen, on Sunday mornings, our kids in their kids zone are going to be talking about the same things we're talking about here. They're going to be talking about. And on Wednesday nights, our middle school and high school students are going to be talking about the same things we talk about here. They're going to be talking about it. And so if you have kids that are in elementary elementary school or youth, uh, we want you to be talking to them. And as you pray over dinner or as you pray at night or whenever you pray with your kids, I want you to be praying, God, help us grow our faith. And I want you to believe that in your family that God's going to do something really cool. Amen? All right. So uh, if you have your notes, if you'll take them out and uh, let, let, let's get into the story. It's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. I want to talk about how do you prepare for a miracle and we're going to look at the most famous miracle, Jesus feeding the 5,000. And really the story is, is it's, really about, it's really about how Jesus turns a little into a lot. And you need this in your life. Come on, there, aren't there times where you need God to turn the little bit you have, and you need to turn, have God turn that into a lot? I, I, I just wrote down a few examples. How many of you have ever come up against and you're just running out of energy, and you need God to take that little bit of energy, and you need to, God to give you a lot of energy? Anybody with me on that? Or, or you have a little bit of talent. I, I identify with this one. A little bit of talent, and you need God to give you a lot of talent. Anybody with me on that? Or you have a little opportunity, and you need God to give you a big opportunity. Or you have a little bit of money, and you need God to give you a lot of money. Anybody with me on that one? <laughs> I, I think all of us are there. There, 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 there are going to be many times in your life where you need to God to turn that little bit in your life into a lot. So how does God turn a little into a lot? That's what this miracle is about. Jesus never did miracles just to show off. There was always, the miracles had a spiritual truth and the spiritual truth in, in Jesus feeding the 5,000 is to show us, here's how you prepare in your life for a miracle where God is able to turn a little into a lot. And this is so important to our bold faith. Listen, I gotta tell you, because every, every one of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them talk about this story. And it's the only miracle that's involved in all four gospels. And, and I think God is saying to us, hey, listen, you ought to pay attention to this miracle in the Bible. So here's the story, let's jump into it. Jesus uh, goes out into the Judean desert and about 5,000 people follow him. And he's teaching all day, and at the end of the day, 5,000 people are hungry. They're about 25 miles from the nearest McDonald's, or I guess if it's Israel, it's got McDavid's. Anybody with me on that? <laughs> and, and anyway, they're, they're far away from a, a source of fast food, and everybody's hungry, and the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, we got a problem. It's late in the day. Everybody's hungry. And Jesus, I love what Jesus says. He looks at him and he says, you feed them. Lord, that's impossible. It's physically, it's practically, it's humanly absolutely impossible for us 12 to feed 5,000 people. And, 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 and you think, well, what's going on here? Jesus is performing a miracle in order to teach us that there's four steps to preparing our hearts for a miracle that God wants to do in our lives. I, I told you that during bold faith that you're going to, you're going to experience some miracles in your life. Amen, Craig, I believe that, yay. Come on, let me say it again. I believe that in the next 50 days that God wants to do a miracle through you in your life, amen? amen. 
And I think God wants to do a miracle in our church. And I think God wants to do a miracle in our small groups. And Jesus is telling us, hey, listen, to prepare your hearts, here are the four keys that you got to get ready for a miracle in your life. Number one, here's the first thing. Would you write this in? This is so important for us to take with us today. Number one is to admit that I have an unsolvable problem. I have to admit, number one, that I have an unsolvable problem. If you don't have an unsolvable problem, then you don't need a miracle. Listen, if you've got a solvable problem, then just solve it. You know, some people come and they say, Craig, you know, I, I, I'm struggling with my weight. I need a miracle. You don't need a miracle. You need a new diet. Come on, exercise a little bit more. A lot of times we want miracles when the reality is, listen, you're just overspending. You need to come up with a plan to get out of debt. You need a plan to, you don't need a miracle. You need a spending plan. But the first step to, is to admit, listen, I have an unsolvable problem. Mark chapter six, verse 34 is where the story that we're looking at today is at. When Jesus saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them and he began to teach them. And by this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came and they said, this remote place, send the people away, Jesus, so that you can go, they can go and buy something to eat. And Jesus answered them and said, you give them something to eat. And they said, well, that would take about eight months of someone's wages. In that passage that I just read, there's three typical re negative responses that people have when they face an unsolvable problem. The first one is people. Here's the first negative response, and that is, and I know you're looking in your notes, and I'm going, it's not in your notes. There's not enough room. So just write it off the side. The first negative response that we have to an unsolvable problem is procrastination. <laughs> When, when, we, when we have a problem, an unsolvable problem, we just keep on putting it off and put it, and, and, and when we don't know how to solve it, uh, we, we just put it off. Anybody like me, and that's one of the things that you just kind of do when, when you're facing a huge unsolvable problem, anybody besides me struggle with procrastination? Do I have a couple people? Yeah, there we go, thank you for being honest. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> They, they, they were, procra I'm joking, they were procrastinating, procrastination, let me tell you something, I know this from experience, procrastination only makes the problem worse. So then the second thing they do, the second thing they do is they pass, they pass the buck, they blame other people. It's, it, it's not really my problem, it's not our problem, it's their fault, they followed you out here. And so the disciples said, send the people away. Not our, we didn't invite the people here. Jesus, let them go find their own food. And then the third thing that we do that's negative is we worry. The disciples are stressed out. The disciples' anxiety is just going into overdrive. And I, I can just imagine Peter. Peter is doing a cost analysis. How much is this food going to cost? How can we keep it hot? How are we going to give it to them? How are we going to clean it up? And how are we going to pass the health permits? You know, I, I'm sure they were thinking about those things. And they, listen, we worry and we worry. I love what Jesus says. Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, you feed them. And Peter goes, no, 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 you gotta be kidding, Jesus. We, we can't do this. So here's the point. Negative responses to problem, uh, uh, when the problem is unsolvable, is procrastination, passing the buck, and worry. And, and, and I, I read this this week. I got in here, and listen, I got in here, and I began to look at this, and all of a sudden it jumped out right off the page at me, and I realized I know what the problem is. I, I, I just went, come on, guys, you gotta see this. Here's what was going on. They're worrying, they're procrastinating, they're blaming other people. People, when you know what? Here's the real issue. Jesus is standing right beside them. Is that crazy? Come on, Jesus, who they saw turn a stone into bread. They know he can do this. There's Jesus, and, and I'm just thinking, come on, Jesus can make hot pockets for everybody. We'll all eat good. And they're standing in the presence of the Son of God and they're going, you know, Jesus, we got an unsolvable problem. Jesus says, you feed them. And they say, well, Lord, it's, 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 it's practically, financially, and humanly, it's impossible. Let me just stop and ask you, has God ever asked you to do something that's impossible in your life? I have. I think God loves to do that. God loves to ask us to do the impossible. You go, Lord, I, I don't have time. God, I don't have money. I don't have energy. I don't have education. You got the wrong person. And God asks us to do something impossible. And like Moses, we go, no, not me. I, I, I'm not gonna do it. Or like Jeremiah, we go, you know, God, why me? 
We need to be like Isaiah. Do you remember a couple weeks ago we talked about him and God said, who am I going to send? And, and, and it's this impossible thing. It's this, you know, I, I don't know how God you're going to do it, but pff, send me. I didn't hear anybody say amen. amen. So let me go through this one more time. <laughs> We need to be like Isaiah, that when God puts an impossible situation in front of us, we go, send me, God, Uh, use me, I'm here. And God says, "I I want you to do the impossible. Why does God ask us to do the impossible? Here's the answer to that. Because God wants to stretch and he wants to grow our faith. It's because every time he does that, when, when, when God asks you to do something, we think it's physically or financially, God, that's impossible, but God puts it in front of us. He's waiting for us to say, yep, I'm in, I'll do it, send me, I'll do the, he wants to grow our faith. This is the first principle. In fact, all these principles I put in your notes because I didn't want you to miss them. Here's principle number one. It's on the back side of your notes, right at the top. It's tucked in right after the top, so you gotta kind of look for it, but here it is. Principle number one, I have to admit that the, uh, that the problem that I'm facing right now is unsolvable. All right, then here's step number two to the miracle. Here's the second key. Number two, give God what little I already have. Give God what little I already have. Jesus says to the disciples, Jesus says, I want you to go out and I want you to see if anybody has any food, any lunches. In Mark chapter six, verse 38, how many loaves do you have? Jesus asked, go and see. And when they found out, they said five uh, small loaves. They're like little biscuits of bread and two fish. One little boy had a sack lunch. Anybody have a problem with that? Come on, see here, I I think you've heard the story so much, you just kind of accept the fact that there was only one person out of 5,000 that brought any lunch. Is that illogical to you guys? Come on, I happen to believe that there was a bunch of people that were hiding their lunch in a, in, a, in a picnic basket underneath their coats because they didn't want to share it with anybody else. They've got it hidden. They don't want to share with their, with their food. And I, I'm thinking a lot of people are, 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 are hiding their food, 5,000 people. Somebody else had some food, don't you think? It's highly doubtful to me that that the boy brought the only thing. But this kid becomes the hero of the story because he's willing to offer up everything he's got. God, I'll give you everything I have. Why did Jesus say, find out how many lunches? This is so important to this story. Why did Jesus say, find out how many lunches are out there? (laughs) Because you see, when you think about this, God doesn't need anybody's lunch in order to do this miracle. Anybody all right with that one? See, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, God doesn't use anybody else. He just snaps his finger a couple times, and all of a sudden, we got pizza rolls flying from the sky like manna. Anybody else with me on that? I I think that would be a really cool thing. God doesn't need anybody else. Here, check this out. So why did Jesus do this? The second principle of the miracle, I wrote it in your notes, is because God always starts with what I have. It may not be much, but I give it to God. God, I don't have much time, but the time that I have, I'm giving it to you. God, I don't have much finances, but the finances I have, I give it all to you. God, I don't have much talent, but the talent I have, I see, God, I, I, I give you everything. I give you my reputation. I give you my heart, soul, strength. I give you my past, my present, my future. God, I'm giving my loaves of bread, my fish, everything. I, I, I give it all to you. It's, it's interesting that God always starts with what I have. Doesn't have to, but that's where he starts. John chapter six, verse six is the same story in the gospel of John. And he gives a little detail that I think is so unique. Here's what John six, six says. It says, Jesus asks this only to test them. He asked to go out and get food only to test them for he already had in mind what he was going to (laughs) do. Which brings me to a great point. Jesus was not sweating it at this point. Anybody all right with that point? Come on. Listen, when God asks you to do the impossible, he's not sweating it. He already has in his mind what he's going to do. He's seen the need long before they did. Jesus has a plan already laid out. I I want you to write this down in your notes because there's there's not some blanks there or anything like that. But just write this down because you're going to need it some point in the next year, maybe in the next few weeks. God always has the answer before I know what the problem is. Come on, that's great. I know, you're writing it down. So I'll I'll, I'll give you a chance to write it down, then I'll say it again. (laughs) 
in your life, God always knows the answer before we even know what the problem is. Okay, you're done writing, right? So everybody said? Jesus saw the problem. He knew it was late. He saw the problem when it was early in the day, and he already had a plan for it. God already knows the solution before you and I even know what the problem is. Man. So here's the question. Why do we worry? Right? So... One, I admit that I have an unsolvable problem. Two, I give God the little bit that I have. And here's three, write this in. I put it all in the hands of Jesus. Question, how much do we put in the hands of Jesus? Yeah, it's, thank you. I was gonna tell you, but thank you for answering. I love that, that's awesome. The correct answer would be all of it. 100%, not 90%. We have this phrase around here, 90% commitment to God is 10% short. Amen? The correct answer is all. The Bible says, verse 41, Jesus took the five loaves, the little biscuits, and, and the two dried fish, and he blessed the food, he broke the loaves, and he, he kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. Here's the third principle. I wrote it in your notes. You don't even have to write anything down. God will use whatever I have. It may not be much, but I give it to God, and what little time, energy, and effort, whatever I've got, I give it all to God, and God will use whatever I give to him. Because of that, we come to the fourth key, fourth thing in preparing for a miracle. Here it is. Number four, expect God to multiply what I give him. I give God whatever I have. I put it in the hands of Jesus, all of it, and then I expect God to multiply it. Notice what happens. Mark chapter six, verse 42. Everyone ate and had enough, and afterwards they collected 12 basketfuls of leftovers. I love this. Can't you imagine everybody going home with doggy bags? Come on, right? They're walking home, and, they, and in fact, I can imagine this kid that gave it all to Jesus, and he walks home, and he's got 12 basketfuls of, of bread and fish all in there, and he walks into his house, and he goes, Mom, look, see what I got? And he go, the mom goes, Jacob, you know, where did you get all this bread and all the fish? And he says, Mom, you're not going to believe this. Jesus, I gave my lunch to Jesus, and he multiplied it. And the mom says, Jacob, go to your room and stay there until you tell me the truth. <laughs> right? because it blows our mind. It's a miracle from God. Come on, would you believe that story? And it leads me to the fourth principle, and that is whatever I give, I love this. Whatever I give, I always get back more. Come on, that's a great principle. Whatever I give out, I promise you, you're gonna get back more. It doesn't mean you give to get. That's a wrong way to give. But I give knowing that God is gonna bless me. The little boy's lunch not only blessed 5,000 people, but he ends up richer himself. I, I could give you so many testimonies to this one, how God blesses you as you bless other people. You cannot, I, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, you, I've tried, I know people that have tried, you cannot outgive God in your life. That's a great principle. And this kid, he ends up with more than he started. Here's the point, and really the big lesson. God likes to do miracles through people, not independently. God loves to use the, the ordinance, ordinariness of people. And, and, and during these 50 days of faith, listen, he doesn't want to just do a miracle for you. God, let me say it again, because some of you are going, what? He doesn't want to just do a miracle for you. God wants to do a miracle through you to bless somebody else. Just like he did with this little boy who gave him everything he had. It wasn't much, but I give you all I got. And God takes it, he blesses it, he multiplies that. Listen, God wants to do that in your life. In fact, that's what this church has been built on. This church has been built on people that said, God, whatever it takes, we're gonna follow you. And as a result, we have found this verse to be so true. Mark chapter 10, verse 27. Would you read this out loud with me? Let's say it together. All things are possible with God. Did you see that? All things? The ultimate example of this is all things possible with God. And the reason that we know that what God uh, uh, has the power to do, what we're talking about this morning, it's called Easter. Did you know that Easter this year is two months away? Easter falls on April 1st. Did you know that? That cracks me up. Uh, anybody else think that's funny? We are gonna celebrate like we've never celebrated before. Because listen, let, let me tell you, I'm, I'm closing it up. Listen, because if God can raise a person from the dead, he can do anything in your life. If God can raise a dead person, then, then he can raise a dead marriage. 
If God can raise a dead human being, he can raise a, a, a dead career or a dead dream or dead finances. Listen to me, if God can raise somebody from the dead, he can do anything. Easter proves it, and I, I, I want to celebrate that today. Connor, come on up and, and lead us if you would, but I want to just kind of close this part of our service down. And I just want to say, I, I just happen to believe there's somebody here today that you've come and you've never said yes to Jesus Christ. You've never opened up your life and asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. And maybe the reason that God brought you here today was that you would go, you know what? If God can do that, maybe he can help me with an unsolvable problem in my life. And here's where you start. You start by saying yes to Jesus Christ. In a moment, I'm just gonna, we're gonna pray. Not right now, but in just a moment, we're gonna pray. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. Some of you here, you've already said yes to Jesus Christ. And you've asked him to come into your life. But man, it's a struggle in your spiritual life because God is calling you to go this way. He, he, wants, he wants you to leave Ur and he wants you to go to a promised land that you don't know where it is. He wants to do something great in your life and you're holding on and you're going, no, no, no. You know, it's different for different people, but God is calling you today to surrender all to him. And I know you're a believer, you're a Christian, you're going to heaven if you die, but I'm just, listen, if you're struggling with God, if you're fighting with God, I wanna tell you today that the greatest peace you can have in your life is when you give God everything. Let it go. Say yes to God. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? Heavenly Father, Thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. We certainly don't deserve it. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and then raising from the dead, rising from the dead to prove you have power over Satan and power over sin and the power to walk into our lives and to help us with those unsolvable problems. Nothing is impossible with you. Now, right now, if you're sitting here and you've never said yes to Jesus, right now, just say, okay, Jesus, yes, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. And the best I know how, from this point forward, I want to follow you. Just say yes to him right now. Or maybe you're here and you're already a believer. You've said yes to Jesus Christ, but, but, but there's something that you're constantly fighting with God. And, and God is just saying, hey, listen. I want to do something great in your life. Would you just surrender it all to me? Everything. Just turn it over to me. Let me run your life. It's like you take the steering wheel of your life and you just go, okay, God, from here on out, I'm just along for the ride. I'm following you. Just say yes to him right now. God, I, I surrender everything to you. Heavenly Father, I pray for people that are saying yes to you like that right now. I pray that you would fill them with your, your peace. May they know a peace that they've never known before. May they feel a weight off of their shoulders and feel like, wow, I, I have this great connection with God. And God, would you send your Holy Spirit to do an incredible work in their life? Would you empower them to make a difference in other people's lives? Jesus, we celebrate you today. We celebrate what you've done, how much you love us. Dying on the cross, rising from the dead. We celebrate that today. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.